Good evening. Welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series. Uh, as a reflection of, of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutrita, Tasmania, the Palawa people. The Palawa are the original and traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today. We come to our online audience from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies in Nipaluna, Hobart. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their deep history and storytelling, knowledge sharing and caring for land. My name is Dr Matt Killingsworth. I'm the Head of Politics and International Relations at the University of Tasmania. I'm going to be hosting this evening's event. I am both honoured and proud to be the host for a Red Cross um, event. I've been involved with the Red Cross for some years now through their international humanitarian law um, and the amazing work that they do. And so the idea of the Red Cross oration, and again, um, extraordinarily proud and humbled to be able to present um, for such a worthwhile institution as the Red Cross this evening. The Island of Ideas series began in 2000 as a way of connecting our community and ideas while, well, while we were unable to host face-to-face -face public events. The online program continues in 2022 in the hope that we can continue to connect Tasmania's community and research to people across our regions and into our global network of ideas and emerging issues. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars, and workshops to nurture the ongoing learning of students, alumni, and the wider community. These conversations are an important part of the university's role. Connection, collegiality, and community date back to our founding and are present in the core of our Tasmanian values. And as we continue to navigate the still uncertain landscape, we hope this series can be a positive outcome in these turbulent times. A few housekeeping matters before we begin, please. For those of you who are in the room with us today, Please take a moment to switch off your mobile phones or into silence so we can avoid any interruptions, please. In the event of an emergency, please follow the direction of the event staff who greeted you on arrival. And toilets are located out here to your left and then to your right. For our online audience, um, please note that your microphone, camera, chat function and raise hand function have all been disabled to protect your privacy. We do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A function which I'll be monitoring throughout the evening, uh, and you can see, which you can see on the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also type questions anonymously if you wish. Uh, we'll address as many questions as possible from both our online and in-room audience um, in the Q&A session, which I'm hosting later tonight. And finally, this lecture has been recorded for later access on YouTube and SoundCloud, and we'll supply the details at the end of the session. It's my pleasure to now introduce Professor Kate Darian-Smith, the Executive Dean of our College of Arts, Law and Education, at the University of Tasmania to provide the official welcome. Thank you, Matt. And on behalf of the University of Tasmania, I'm really thrilled to be here this evening and I'd like to express a heartfelt welcome to all of you who have joined us, whether you're in the, the lecture theatre here at IMAS or at home watching online and feeling quite snugly as the weather becomes a bit colder. And look, it's a great honour to be part of what is now a long-standing tradition. Now in its 16th year, the annual Red Cross Oration is a collaboration between the University of Tasmania and the Australian Red Cross. And I'd just like to echo um, Matt's words about how important it is that the university is in partnership with such a wonderful organisation. The purpose of the oration is to contribute to advancing public understanding of issues that connect broadly with the values and principles of the university, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. The oration is an interdisciplinary dialogue concerning issues of human significance in the contemporary world. And topics alternate each year between issues surrounding international humanitarian law and the work with communities on the ground performed by the Red Cross. And I, I just uh, was reflecting and thinking that um, at this point in time, it's really important to think of the role of community and connection. And I think never in the short history 
an illustrious tradition of the Serration, has it been more important to discuss how we can come together as a community and build a more connected and resilient future? There is no shortage of crises in our current landscape. Um, and I think we're surrounded by different crises all the time at very different levels. Um, the increase in mental health presentations, particularly among younger people, uh, is, is of great concern. We've got war in the Ukraine, there's been floods and other climatic events um, of great significance. And overall, and hanging above those, the implications of climate uh, change and of course COVID-19. And I could go on, um, but we really are at a point where so many things are happening uh, and there is so much, um, I suppose the issues are so big, it would be understandable sometimes to feel that any personal contribution might be uh, insignificant. I think that sense of overwhelming as those events shape us. But uh, and it's in that context that our speakers have joined us today to share with us not only how they and the people around them are building programs, initiatives and organisations that have real impacts on our local communities and beyond, but how we might do the same in small ways as an individual. So this evening, I would especially like to welcome our speaker, Hannah Miller, as well as our um, panelists, Matt Etherington and Natea Brandjaporn. And to all of you attending online or in the room this evening, uh, we've got a treat ahead of us. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Red Cross Oration, so evocatively titled, Turbulent Times, Opportunities for Action. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate. I would, our format for this evening is that we have a keynote speaker who I'll introduce to you shortly, uh, and then panelists, as Kate alluded to, um, of which we will have a discussion um, down here at the front and with Natalia online. And then we'll open up for Q&A um, before we wrap up the evening. So it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote uh, speaker this evening, Hannah Miller. Hannah is a community designer, humanitarian problem solver. I think this should have been first, Hannah. Artistic juggler. <laughs> so cool. Um, Hannah's passion for the arts, sustainability and community have led her to launch several ventures with a focus on local connection and resilience. From music production to venture design, Hannah likes to challenge systems and the status quo. In her current role as the community builder, community action and mobilisation for the Australian Red Cross, Hannah is helping to reimagine and redefine volunteering with a focus on self-organised humanitarian action. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Hannah Miller. Thank you so much, Matt, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for gathering here today. Um, I'm really honoured to be here and to have been invited to be the guest speaker for this um, lecture series. And um, so I'd like to extend a big thank you to University of Tasmania and Australian Red Cross for inviting me along. Um, I'm also really excited to see um, young people um, taking the stage in this conversation. So um, looking forward to the conversations with Matt and Natea as well. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about something I'm extremely passionate about, um, which is community and um, more specifically, how we can participate actively and meaningfully within community to build um, socially connected and resilient communities. Um, I've forgotten my thank you. There we go. Um, but first, I would like to um, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're gathered on today, the Mwinina people and the Palawa people, and uh, pay my respects to their ancestors past, present and emerging, and um, extend that acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the lands right across Australia from where um, our guests might be dialing in from online. Um, today, as we talk about connection and resilience and community, I also wanted to recognise that our First Nations people for thousands of years have been living in deep connection with the land, 
with each other and building connected and resilient communities, helping each other in times of crisis and um, recognise that we have much to learn from their example. Um, so when I started at Red Cross many years ago, well, several years ago, um, I didn't know a lot about volunteering and I certainly didn't know anything about community action. Um, and I soon learned uh, in this kind of emerging space um, that actually I had already been doing a lot of community action already. I'd started my own social enterprise and I'd been, you know, using my time for good in various ways, but I hadn't uh, volunteered in more formal ways as such. And it wasn't until uh, the bushfire crisis of 19, uh, 2019 to 20 um, that I realised uh, and, and saw firsthand just how um, ingenious we can all be in creating unique solutions um, during times of crises from, you might recall, the empty esky idea or, um, you know, I saw bands and um, people raising funds in really creative and unique ways and I'm sure that you've got some examples of your own. So um, perhaps I should introduce myself. Um, as Matt mentioned, my name's Hannah Miller and I'm a designer and community builder at Australian Red Cross and more specifically in an innovation team at Australian Red Cross. And we have formed in response to these shifts that are occurring, this, these times that are changing and I don't need to convince you, I'm sure that there are shifts occurring, um, but for us, what we're interested in is how um, these shifts, are, sorry, is the shifts in how people are organizing and how people are um, connecting with organizations like ours and what role we can still play um, in, in that space. Um, we're seeing that people are increasingly taking action in uh, really diverse ways. Um, they're building movements on social media, they're starting their own social enterprises, they're raising funds on, you know, gaming platforms, and um, they're starting their own initiatives like that empty esky one I mentioned. So volunteering is undergoing some really big changes, and um, it's institutions and organisations that are not keeping up with those changes. And so... Um, what we don't really understand just yet is how we can align those more informal actions um, to work together towards creating larger movements of change on important issues like climate change and mental health and so on. So you might be interested also to know that these kind of informal actions are key or a key to building more connected and resilient communities. So I have a couple of questions for you just to think about, and I want you to just think about whether you'd answer yes or no to these questions. Are you and your community disaster prepared? Are you taking action on the issues that matter most to you? Do you feel confident to tackle the challenges of the future? So if you answered yes to one of these, you're doing really well. And if you answered no to all of them, you're not alone. Um, I know for myself, when I think about the issues that matter to me, like climate change, there's so much more that I could be doing. And I think we all feel that to an extent. We know for young people that the biggest barrier to them taking action is not knowing where to start. And that's a really, really common occurrence. So, Today, I want to recognise that there's people taking action in all kinds of ways. I'm sure um, everyone in this room is no doubt um, doing something in your community. So this isn't about convincing you to start. It's recognising that um, you're already doing things in community, but maybe there's more that we could do or that you're interested in doing. And for us to think about, in this time, people are increasingly lonely feeling like communities are more fragmented than ever, and there's less and less trust in institutions. Um, so our work with Swinburne has um, shown us that people who participate in activities that build their social connection increase their mental well-being um, and overall well-being. 
We know from working with our Red Cross members that taking action or participating in community helps you to build and live with a sense of purpose and pride. We know from our work with volunteers that um, skill development and building your capacity is a huge benefit of community action. And we know that social connection within the community equals the resilience of the community. So for every act that you do in community that strengthens the social connection or the social fabric, you're actually making your community more prepared, more resilient and more able to rebuild. And so in this time, if you're feeling overwhelm and fear, we know from working with people in emergencies that for those that are affected, it can also be a real purpose and pride building um, uh, activity, sorry. <laughs> um, it can help you build your purpose and sense of purpose and pride um, by helping those around you. And so if you're fearing, feeling fear or overwhelm, the best thing that you can do is to take action on the issues that matter to you and use that overwhelm, turn it into fuel for good. So I'm gonna take us on a bit of a tangent and talk about when I was a kid's yoga teacher um, in my university days. And I loved this job. I would take around this big bag full of yoga mats and yoga toys and games and things to, from childcare center to childcare center. And I remember so clearly whenever I would walk into the room, the kids would be like, yoga's here, yoga. And they always called me yoga. And they'd say, hey, yoga, can I, can I help you with something? And I'd reach into my bag and pull out a ball and I'd give one a ball. And then they'd be like, can I help you too? And then I'd have to come up with something else they could, they could take from my basket before, before I knew it, the bag would be empty and each kid was following me in a, in, in a train carrying one item from my bag. And it was the first time, I guess, I really realized that Deep down, all of us inherently want to help. And we all have these unique ways that we can show up and we can help. And that's the opportunity for organizations like ours, like Red Cross, and for all of us, is to help people to understand and, and embody their strengths and um, their inherent desire to do good. So Red Cross is an international movement that's built on helping people through difficult times and in every country Red Cross people organize together to protect lives in, in times of crisis. And in this time where we're polarized, polarized along political lines, humanitarianism acts as a, provides a way for us to act in solidarity in a way that transcends our differences. It's about helping pe it's about people helping people. And we're also seeing this rise of the idea of um, charity versus solidarity. It's not, it's not so much about charity anymore because as we've seen through COVID, there's no one that is unaffected by COVID. And so we are both the person that's helping and the person that needs to be helped. And through our shared vulnerability, that's how we find our shared humanity. And we can't do it alone. Um, no institution, no single brand, no individual is able to change climate change or, you know, change the mental health crisis. We have to work together and each of us has to individually change our behaviour, our actions and the ways that we have are in relationship with each other. And it sounds corny when I say it, but like actually every single action that you take matters. And it's about our combined efforts all working towards long lasting change together. That's how we create long lasting change. If you think about the movement for single use plastic, um, which we're now starting to see really uh, a lot of change happening on, that's been going on for years and it's taken organizations to change the way they package things. It's taken people to change their behaviors and remember their green bags. It's taken restaurateurs to change the way they package their takeaway food. 
It's taken supermarkets to, to rethink how they um, provide bags. It's, it's been a collective effort. And that's an example of how we need to work towards um, movements together. But sometimes it's not always clear exactly what we should do. And that is why our team was formed, um, to help to think about how we can reduce those barriers and really invest in people power to build these movements. Uh, volunteering with organizations we've known for some time has been on its way down. And you might think initially that that means people are not interested or they don't care, but actually it is that people are taking action in very different ways now and in more informal ways is how I guess we say it in the organization. The definition from Volunteering Australia has been uh, changed over the last couple of years. Um, the definition of volunteering, sorry. To be volunteering is time willingly given for good. And that is, has been changed in order to include these kind of informal actions that we take in community. So what we know for young people is that they are way more interested in one-off volunteering, in micro-volunteering. 58% of young people that we've connected with are reading books or listening to podcasts or um, sharing things on their social media. And 11% are starting initiatives and businesses, which is like a lot of entrepreneurs and, and you know, entrepreneurial thinking in our networks. So how do we channel these efforts into broader movements? Um, and we use in our team behavioral science to understand the motivations and the why, like how, how and why people wanna take action. And we also design solutions to help people to be able to take action in these more one-off kind of micro ways. And we think about it along a spectrum of behavior. So that example of reading books and listening to podcasts all the way through to starting a business, um, within that spectrum, there are lots and lots of different actions that people can take. And it doesn't always have to be volunteering with an organization. Um, so some of the things that we've been working on, uh, and when I say we, my team, but also, uh, amazing staff and, and teams across Australia. And one of them is the Tasmanian um, team here who ha we have the 50 ways to do more good poster here and more information out the front. Um, we've worked on projects like, like 50 ways to do good. And um, we have uh, a nuclear toolkit online, which is an example of, you know, if you wanna take action on nuclear, you can download that. And there's, there's micro actions within that. And for people that are already taking, you know, taking action in community or um, running their own initiatives. We've had programs like our Red X Youth Activators, which is a 10 week program to nurture young leaders and help them build their entrepreneurial skills to solve uh, problems within com their communities. So um, this is Natea and, and Natea is actually joining us tonight. So I won't um, tell too much of her story and, and give it away, but I put her picture here because um, Disastrous Dinners is a really great example of one of these initiatives that's actually been designed by a young person. And um, Disastrous Dinners is uh, a, um, a men menu or dinner menu, and, and Natea is going to do a much better explanation, I'm sure, um, that helps people to be able to host a dinner with their friends and family and get everyone around them disaster prepared. Um, this is Nova. This is a young woman who um, we've been connected with and she's actually attending our youth summit next week. And Nova was already running initiatives in her, um, in her uh, community. And after connecting with us with the Red X Youth Activators Program, she started a business to empower female Indigenous entrepreneurs to set up their own social media platforms and websites. Um, and this is Emerald, who has like a huge passion for fashion. And she decided that it would be a really great idea to start a Depop page and um, start selling her clothes and her friends' clothes and make it really cool and um, and raise money for Red Cross. And that's been a really big success too. So the thread between all of these stories from Natea, who's passionate about um, disaster preparedness and a really organized person to uh, Emerald, who's 
um, really passionate about fashion and a really creative person to Nova, who's a really great organizer and she's activating people in her community. We're starting to think within our, our team, and I want to challenge you to start to think about this, is what are your strengths? And these are the humanitarian strengths that we've come up with. Um, maybe you've got some other strengths that you might use too, but this is a good place to get started. So maybe people online wanna do a screenshot or something, feel free to take a photo. Um, but some of the ways that we're thinking about it is, you know, how, how can you influence people? Do you have a strength of influencing, whether it's on social media or maybe more in governance roles? Um, are you an explorer? Do you have a thirst and a curiosity for finding new information? Do you love listening to podcasts and reading books? Or are you more of a, an academic that loves to write and learn? Are you a connector? Are you someone that loves to build relationships? Do you like to, um, yeah, strengthen the, the social connection within your community? Or, you know, are you connecting people online or an, a real networker? So there's a bunch of examples here and, and um, I won't go into all of them because I'm sure I'm running out of time, but I think we can make this available. Um, but I guess to just round everything out, I would say next steps for you. I've got three challenges for you. Um, one is to reflect on your own strengths. Um, you could use our strengths or you could use your own, your strengths, your passions, your interests and pick your top three. And in doing so, maybe you like to journal or just have a think about it, um, but think about how you could use those strengths to build the connection in your community. Perhaps it's something, fundraising is something you're interested in. Um, how could you use those strengths to take action on an issue like climate change? And how could you use it to get your community disaster prepared? The second uh, challenge I have for you is to act. And, um, as I mentioned, the 50 ways to do more good. We're challenging people to, to take one action from our 50 ways to do good this May. Um, and you'll find on our website, I've got, the, got it there, or you could scan the code. Um, and there's uh, brochures at the front. Um, but yeah, really encourage you to, to just try one of our actions and, and see how you go. And don't forget to hashtag us if you do. Um, and finally, connect in, and particularly if you're a young person, we have a whole movement happening um, called Red X Youth and really encourage you to, to join uh, via the website and find out more. Um, but yeah, if you want to stay connected with us um, and if you're interested in how we're thinking about community action, um, please yeah, get in touch and um, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. So thank you. All right, brilliant. Before I try and set up some framing perhaps for our conversation this evening, I'm going to get Matt Etherington to come down and join us on the panel. Hannah's going to sit down as well. We're going to introduce Natalia um, and we're going to have a discussion framed around what Hannah's amazing presentation just spoke about. Before I introduce Matt and Natalia though, I thought if it was okay with you, Hannah, I might ask you to elaborate on a few of the points that you made as they might relate to that tension that you sort of identified as, and, and I think it relates to sort of COVID as the spectre that sort of hangs over volunteering at the moment and sort of the breakdown of how we, we, we understood community previously to COVID. And so you've set up this really amazing scenario in which you've spoken about the need for volunteering and a desire to volunteer amongst young people while simultaneously identifying a disenfranchisement perhaps or a frustration with I guess political discourse with um, and the capacity to be able you spoke about sort of dislocation a little bit as well and I think much of this is perhaps amplified here in Tassie as well so what is, is my summary sort of uh, correct in some ways of sort of what the tensions that you're that you're talking about and that you've provided solutions for us for? Yeah, I think so. And, and, um, and definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that, but let me know if I go through the mail and have a fight. But um, I think. 
sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, I think uh, what you're talking about is really the increased lack of trust in institutions and organisations that we're seeing, particularly with young people. And um, yet there is this, there is an assumption, I guess, um, and I hear it often that young people have plenty of time and they just don't want to help and they're not interested. Um, and all of these assumptions that we carry around and actually young people do want to help, like the majority of them want to help and want to do something. Young people are really time poor, um, more time poor than probably um, myself and anyone older is actually able to understand what university and, and those kind of juggling all of these things is, is like for that that generate for younger generations now and um they live in much more you know hybrid kind of ways than i guess the older people may be making these assumptions um can understand sorry i'm just getting a strange echo yeah that's me <laughs> um <laughs> for a brief second sorry hopefully we, hopefully we fix that up now sorry no um, and, and what we know is that young people want just more flexibility. They don't necessarily want to commit to roles that are 20 hours a week or have very de defined time schedules. It's, you know, they want to volunteer and they want to help, but we need to meet them where they're at. And so that tension that you're talking about is for organisations that are built on these more traditional ways of volunteering as we start to try and shift and, and cater to younger generations and, and these changes that I'm referring to, there's going to be a natural tension there until we're able to, you know, start to hold both of those um, really well. I like that idea of meeting in the middle. I think it's an idea we might come <laughs> back to today. I know this is a conversation I've had with Matt a fair bit about youth volunteering and sort of the maybe the shift in altruism, perhaps, but I'll come back to that idea. So this is an ideal opportunity now for me to introduce our two panellists um, that are going to expand our discussion before we get on to our Q&A. Um, joining us on stage is Matt Etherington. Matt was the 2019 Tasmanian Young Achiever of the Year. Um, he's passionate about building healthy, inclusive communities. He's part of innovative initiatives that tackle social problems, including community education on migrant support and community soccer programs for people experiencing disadvantage. Um, while studying at the University of Tasmania, and I've got here in my notes as one of my students, so Matt's clearly overcome that burden of being one of my students to achieve um, all of these wonderful things that he has. Um, Matt founded Student Mental Health Tasmania to improve mental health and wellbeing through training and community events. And joining us online um, via Zoom is Natalia Brangiporn, who is co-founder of Disastrous Dinners. Um, Natalia is a PhD candidate who volunteers with the Australian Red Cross, Queensland Youth Advisory Committee, um, also known as QYAC, for those of us in the room who speak Red Cross. Um, and she's been working hard to develop a disaster preparedness community education tool called Disastrous Dinners. Matt, if you don't mind, thinking about the... Sorry, have I gone to a bad time? Just as about you get yourself a drink. Sorry. Um, thinking about some of the themes that Hannah raised, um, can you... ...your founding of... Student Mental Health Tasmania and perhaps the community soccer program that you're involved in as well, please. Yeah, of course. Um, I was really inspired by that, like connecting a lot of the messages and I think I'm doing those things again. So even maybe for some of you who are experienced volunteers or already engaged, this is a chance to reset and, and continue to dive into that. Because I know for me it takes, Maybe, maybe you get pushed away by something that you're demoralized by and you need to dive back in. So that's been like that for me. Student Mental Health Tasmania started actually from my lived experience. So in 2014, I contracted glandular fever. And following on from that, I developed chronic fatigue, which is sort of an invisible condition which affects 250,000 Australians. Um, and I, I retreated in every sense and ended up um, in early 2015, not really wanting to be here at all. Um, I was in the middle of study. I was connected with friends, but I, I wasn't really present. And reaching the, the, the lowest point in my life. Right. 
Thanks, guys. It's just the online audience couldn't see the panel. <laughs> so you'll have to look at yourselves on the big screen, but it's fine. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, from that low point, I, I had to discover that the purpose and drive that you were talking about and the community that I found was initially through the Red Cross. Uh, and that, that drove me to develop that idea behind Student Mental Health Tasmania. The core of it being that um, helping others helps you. And for many young people that are dealing with the barriers around mental health, learning how to help others is that way in. Um, and, and the same sort of core message behind the soccer program. I found that program through my own experiences of, of suffering through mental health issues. And that empowered me to, to understand a bit more about disability and, and use my lived experience to connect with people who are going through maybe more profound um, disadvantages to, to identify those strengths that they have. And in many cases, people with a disability are told and, and come to believe that they can't do things that they can do, um, but they maybe need a bit more support to do it. Um, so yeah, that hopefully that answers what you were after there. It, it does, and, I, and I'm, I'm also sort of keen because I know, I'm also interested in sort of your interest in sport and how you saw that as also an avenue perhaps through which to, I guess, not just mobilize participation, but also, the sort of the, uh, I guess, tap into the humanitarian principles that Anna mentioned that are also at the core of sort of what we do with the Red Cross movement as well. Mm. Yeah, so the soccer program targets people who are critically disadvantaged, people for whom many, many sports have failed to deliver what they need in terms of connecting with people and, and um, working on their health outcomes. And they people find that sport like art or music can be used to connect in ways that maybe nothing else can. And when somebody has a ball at their feet, they can talk through something that maybe they were too afraid to talk about. They can um, break down social anxiety in order to connect with people maybe for the first time. And they can be in a safe team environment when they've spent all of their life, sometimes decades and decades, not ever feeling that way, not at home, not in their community, not in work. Um, but a sporting environment can create that. And it's, yeah, you need, to, you need to understand people's needs, but that is something that everybody can be a part of, whether, it, whether it's sport, whether it's art, whether it's music. Natalia, um, we've been speaking a little bit, and you've obviously listened to Hannah's presentation this morning, and we've been engaging in these ideas of participation um, and the tension with ideas of sort of dislocation um, um, sort of um, being disenfranchised, but with the idea of almost a little bit of sort of a field of dreams idea, build and they will come um, kind of idea. So with that in mind, did you want to talk to us a little bit, please, about what um, inspired you to do disastrous dinners and in turn sort of what that's done with respect to some of the things that Hannah um, has raised this evening? Sure, thanks, Matt, and um, lovely to be here tonight. Um, I think a, a few things based on sort of volunteering and participation that I really like what um, Matt just spoke about around like our lived experience. And I think um, so, I, I think that's where it started for disastrous dinners as well. So, as um, we've heard a little bit, Disastrous Dinners is a community engagement tool which is really used to sit alongside a dinner party. Um, it has uh, different elements for uh, drinks, for entree, for mains, for dessert, to talk about different elements of um, a disaster plan to be prepared um, for what could happen um, if there was a flood or, or a bushfire where you live um, so you would know where your things are, uh, you've got a go bag, um, you know where you're going to meet with people um, and you know who you're going to call upon um, to, to ask for help. And really uh, the idea started from our experiences um, living through, uh, living in this house actually um, and experiencing flooding um, and um, my co-founder who experienced the 2019 bushfires down south as well, sitting here thinking as young people, um, 
it's hard to uh, it's hard to know where you're going to live, let alone what um, natural disasters you might encounter. And um, from moving from share house to share house, we realized actually we're really not prepared. But what we love to do is have dinner together with our friends, um, and we can use this time when we're just enjoying time with each other, connecting together to connect about things that are more meaningful, which is um, preparing uh, for the natural disasters that we all encounter wherever you live in Australia and around the world more and more so each day. Um, I, I think one of the things that um, resonates as, as Hannah talked about is that sometimes it does feel really overwhelming around like um, climate change and around like what how you how you are supposed to prepare or how you help other people around you um, but but really I think through reflecting, I think I really like that reflecting around what your experience is, where your expertise is, the things that you enjoy as young people, um, I think is the best place to start and the best place to think, oh, actually, these things that we can do, they actually might help other young people too. And that's, and, and I think that, that some of those ideas generated through chatting about that is a really great place to start. Brilliant. All right, so we've got a, we've got a, another set of themes I think we can engage with for a minute before we open it up to Q and A as well. So I'm I'm really I think Natalia, you raised this interesting sort of idea when you alluded to share housing as being a different circumstance perhaps than that that certainly I experience at the moment. Um, and at the risk of sort of I'll have to be very careful of stereotypes this evening. So there's a, a bit of a sort of a, a um, a stereotype warning here. I am interested in two things and how I'd really like to ask you first and then Matt and then You mentioned this idea of how do you avoid being overwhelmed? And this is a question that I get a fair bit in the, the, the things that I've been talking about with global events at the moment, um, Ukraine in particular, but other uh, events of which there are no shortage of catastrophes and atroc uh, um, uh, atrocities in the world at the moment. And so I was quite taken okay, when you said that part of volunteering and, and something that Matt said as well, the capacity to volunteer is perhaps about being over or overcoming being overwhelmed. Did you want to start with that one? Do you mind, please, Hannah? Sure, thank you. Um, and I'm sure we can all relate to the feeling of being overwhelmed. And, you know, when we think about mental health crisis or climate change, as you, as you mentioned, I think... It can feel so big at times that we just kind of freeze and, and, and it's also not exactly clear on what we should do anyway. And so you feel like you're doing nothing and, um, and you want to do something, but, you know, it's all big and scary. And I think, um, you know, initiatives like 50 Ways to Do Good and, and, and you know, reflecting on your own strengths or, or disastrous dinners are examples of things. You know, I, I'm a very organised person person and, and, and maybe the way I would think about it is you know what am I what am I able to achieve um, and you know where, within the resources and limitations like time limitations that I have maybe I can commit to one action a month and maybe I can track that action and that has to be good enough um, because as I mentioned in, in my talk earlier is that what's most important is that we take one action because your single action is going to contribute um, or, so, or your single behavior change is going to contribute to um, the collective movement. And, and I think having that kind of approach to getting started or, or you know, continuing if you are already doing things is really important and, and, um, and just be easy on yourself for lack of sounding cheesy, like just, you know, if you can do one action a month or every couple of months and that's what you can do, that, that's an action. And I think if we all think about that, um, you know, that's, that's how we're going to start to create change. And, and maybe it's about picking one issue that you really care about and it's climate change. Or maybe you want to try different actions in different areas and see what um, inspires you. Um, that's, that's how I would think about approaching it. And I like the idea of sort of, incrementalism as well change happens slowly doesn't it yeah yeah um, and that matt did you want to speak a little bit about sort of uh, avoidance of being overwhelmed yeah i could talk about this one for a day but i'm going to try and limit it to three points um moral overload is the sort of the social theory term for that feeling of 
having a moral problem that's bigger than you as an individual can deal with it. And it tends to switch people off. And there are three techniques that I use when I talk with students about moral overload. The first one I'd actually like to do with the audience and with, with you as well. I call it snowballing. I'm sure I didn't come up with it first, but it's the exact opposite of catastrophizing. So if, if you're a student maybe listening to this, you've probably thought, what if I fail this assignment? I'll fail the unit. I'm going to have to pay for it. I'm going to like, lose my job. I'm going to fail the course. My family's going to disown me. Um, it does happen fast, and it happens in less than a second in the brain for most people. And that's that's what anxiety feels like at its extreme. Um, and snowballing is the exact opposite. So you identify one good thing. For example, I'm going to say a disastrous dinner. And what might follow on from that, that is a logical good consequence of that. So what are, what are some good logical consequences that came out of disastrous dinners that you had, Natalia? Uh, people realizing what natural disasters are actually affecting them in their area and people preparing what will be in their um, sort of like their go bag. Brilliant. So they, they have this go bag, maybe they create the go bag, then maybe somebody in the audience, what would they do with that go bag? Show how to use it if they needed to. Yeah, yeah. And maybe their family learns too. Yeah. Yeah, so they, they might uh, learn how to use it and then actually have to use it. So then maybe they have survived a disaster because of that go bag, because they used it, then, then what might happen? The benefits of doing that exercise become more widely understood. Yeah, so people go, actually, this go bag is really useful. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but that go back is really useful. I'm going to tell my friends that it saved my life. Yeah. Any other thoughts? It gets to other people. Yeah, exactly. And maybe maybe they get a passion for it and they decide to run a disastrous dinner themselves back to the back to the start of it. But that is a really great exercise in killing moral overload where it starts by just sort of reversing the process and going in the other direction. Moral overload can be turned in on its head and really sort of that, the idea of the snowball of incremental change. Second one, simple one, is the fact that most of the positive impact you have on people is often invisible. There's a, there's a really strong um, uh, social observation that people actually feel less comfortable sharing positive things than they do in complaining. So if, if, if you have a positive impact on someone's life, a lot of the time you won't get to see that. Um, but that change is there. And the third, the third one is that if you impact one individual, say myself, my involvement with volunteering um, saved my life, I think. And I've then engaged in the community. Other people might hear my story and, and even people with chronic fatigue and think, I can survive this, I can get involved in my community, and they might then have the same impact. And that will impact others and will impact generations after that as well. Brilliant. Uh, did you want to add some? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think ones? there's some great points there already raised. I think I, I, just a few things. I mean, I liked how Hannah talked about focusing on one issue to just, I guess, sit alongside that. I think feel free to not know what that issue is. And, and not know sort of that one thing that you might be passionate about. You know, use your, use your time um, at uni or beyond to, to give things a go and to say, hey, I, um, I'm interested in that. I'm going to find some people, other people who are interested in that and learn from them. I think that volunteering is a great way to learn from other people. Um, and, and that way, um, this, these issues that, that might seem overwhelming from the outset um, are not are not unknown and, and giant. You can put faces to names, people that are working on those issues. You're understanding different aspects of them, understanding the layers of complexity, um, and, and you're really um, learning the different parts of that. So feel free to explore, um, and that can help to, um, to, to really, I guess, take another route or um, to sort of uh, let, be left a field of this feeling of feeling overwhelmed. I mean, I think the second thing is um, to share that feeling with other people and you'll actually realise other people might feel the same and, and they can share their experiences of what they're doing. Um, and then I think the third one, I, which has sort of already been mentioned, but I think it's this sense that 
although it seems invisible, the things that we're doing together, um, they create um, so much impact um, around the world, young people um, are doing so much. And I think it's to, to, to really think about rather than you being an individual and focusing on that collective action um, as a whole as well. You just inspired me. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite parts of having conversations about this is what was described to me by a Red Cross person as the growing zone. And actually when you're in that feeling of, oh God, this is so tense and I don't know what to do about it. Actually, you're, you're the closest you will ever be to creating a solution to that problem because you're, you're in it, you're thinking about solutions towards it. And in, in the mental health space, that is critical because if you wanna make a decision to help somebody, you need to be willing to sit in that feeling of uncomfortability for them. And I think broadly speaking, thinking about volunteering in this context, dealing with and sitting in these really uncomfortable feelings like moral overload actually is essential to getting towards solutions and, and, and maybe, um, one of the crucial things that we can contribute as individuals is, is to hold people in that space in a, in a productive way. So returning to one of your points, just quickly, Matt, uh, you already have people thanking you online for, <laughs> yeah, which is, which is nice. Uh, uh, thanks, Matt, sorry. I was just going to add to that. <laughs> Um, that, you know, I think going back to that definition of volunteering that I mentioned in, in the talk before, that's, that's been redefined as, um, and I'm not going to say it exactly right, but um, exchanging your time for, for, the, for, for doing good, basically. I think rethinking um, volunteering and, and, the, and the way you show up in community is, is um, key to that and, and not expecting yourself to be doing this amount of volunteering hours for an organisation, but that going and checking on your neighbour or listening to a podcast on climate change or um, reading a book to educate yourself about an issue, these are all um, acts of you using your time for, for good. And so really kind of shifting your own thinking about what that means um, is really important. I think this is also a really good point for us. I mean, we're obviously all in the Red Cross family here that... What we're speaking about today, and this comes to Peter's point that he's made online, this has applicability across volunteering organisations everywhere and anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, we, we hope the message that we're giving today is for, of course, we'd love you to do stuff with the Red Cross, um, but we're also the idea of this is a, a universal message on participation um, and involvement. I have one more question for the panel until I, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. And this is a point that was raised kind of by you in your presentation and the Taylor in the, the um, conversation we had the other day about the changing nature of volunteering. And I sense that perhaps when I started volunteering or the expectations of the volunteering of the organisation you're volunteering for is that it's primarily altruistic. And we talk about sort of the, that changing nature of what volunteering is about. So Natalia, do you mind sort of starting perhaps with what that might look like? Is there something perhaps that the organisation you're volunteering for owes the volunteer? Yeah, that's a great thought. And I think volunteering has shifted within my lifetime. I, I mean, I like to look at it as sort of like a, tri a triangle, really, and that I, th I think traditionally I've always thought like, okay, volunteers sort of sit like here in the organisation. But I feel like um, especially my experience within Disaster Stint, it's sort of inverted that volunteers are sort of crucial parts of organisations like the Red Cross um, in that, um, for example, with our initiative, it was our idea, we own the idea, and rather Red Cross provided the resources, support, and um, I guess the platform to be able to distribute that engagement tool. Um, I think secondly, this I, uh, I guess this, this movement around startups and um, project development um, and seeking funding and other things more independently um, I think has has been blended, I guess, into that in, sense of innovation has been blended into uh, volunteer organisations like the Red Cross. Um, so I think that sense of like there is ownership in in the things that we're doing, um, and and I think that that young people have a greater significance 
in, in generating those ideas and seeing them through to execution. Um, I think secondly, there's also uh, more roles in terms of advocacy and policy where, um, where, where volunteers have um, a greater uh, role in, um, in governance and strategy and policy of, of larger organisations as well. Um, and I think some of those shifts, I think, then provides more of a balance of power, I guess, um, and a sense that uh, you can own the things that you're contributing to and um, really see how you've contributed to the impact of that work as well. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Matea. That was um, really good. And I guess just to build on that, um, what I think you're touching on there is really the value exchange between volunteers and organisations like ours or volunteer organisations is that um, it's no, well, it's not no longer enough to, to just, you know, want to do good, but the shift that you're referring to is that um, increasingly people are wanting to build their capacity and um, build their skills and um, yeah, build their capacity as change makers in communities. So um, we know for young people, um, and I'm going to get the number exactly, not exactly right, but I think it's 68% from um, our survey of young people this year um, want to build skills um, as part of them connecting to the organisation. So we need to really rethink what that value exchange is. And um, we do that in a number of ways. As I mentioned, we um, ran our Red X Youth Activators program, which was all about upskilling young people who are already doing things in community to build their capacity um, as, as leaders and change makers. Um, but also we need to be thinking about, um, with all of our programs, we think about, um, uh, sorry, all of our particular youth programs, we're thinking about, well, how do we, not only bring them in um, and, and their expertise to co-design this, this you know, idea or this solution, but how do we also use this as a chance to help them learn design thinking, learn about social innovation, um, maybe they can practice facilitation, um, all of those kinds of things. So there's this extra layer now to, to volunteering that I think um, you know, is, is going to help us in this market where we're seeing, um, sorry, but this answer's going on. <laughs> um, one, one of the big shifts that we're seeing is, is that people used to attach their identity to an organisation like I'm a Red Cross person, and now they're much more an issues-based person. So I'm, I'm a climate change person, I'm a, you know, a this person. And so people are more likely to shop organisations that are able to speak to their identity. And so organisations have this kind of, uh, like healthy competition, I guess, to um, retain volunteers in that way. And so um, building people, people's capacity and, and upskilling them is, is one way to do that. Very quickly, Matt. Oh. You assume I have something to say, which is I'm glad that I was thinking about something. I was literally writing it down. Um, I, I found that I'm imagining somebody might contact me afterwards and say you're wrong, but my strong view is that altruism doesn't exist at all. Um, there's a spectrum of it, but in my opinion, volunteering is should always be an equal value exchange. And in my case, um, when I help somebody in the mental health space, I, I describe it sort of my my future TED talk. I don't know is paying backwards. And for me, what I find extremely cathartic and therapeutic is helping somebody that I can use my skills to help them at a time when I didn't have that support. So for me, I was very um, deeply affected by my severe bullying experiences. And when I can go into school and, and talk to them about what it feels like, what, it, what that can create in the life of that person, and they can avoid that harm or even make somebody who's experienced bullying feel a sense of, of belonging, like they're no longer alone, like there's a life after that traumatic experience, that helps me just as much. Because it's 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 a form of reprocessing. It gives me serotonin, and I can go back home and think I've made a positive impact. And to me, that that is very equal, if not more, of a value exchange for me. Brilliant. All right, we have about. Wow, I haven't even asked the Q and A. You should be shooting up already. Excellent. We have about fifteen to keep an eye on the time. Fifteen to twenty minutes for Q and A. We've got a roving mic, so we've already got one. And two, 
Uh, and we might take them in pairs if that's all right, and then I'll, I'll direct them around our, our panel. And do you mind my name's Noria. Okay. Matt, I love you when I can see. I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> But can I just ask for the conversation to be perhaps a little bit more inclusive of not just youth? I wish I was still young, but I'm not 30 anymore. Only just girls, I'm just. But um, I'm very passionate about building capacity and that's why I was really excited about this, to come along. I have ideas. I am involved in my community, but I need to learn capacity of the new way of communicating. Um, and I just... To be honest, up until now, until I've been able to say that I felt excluded rather than included, but I'm inspired with what you're saying. But I'm on board. I want to be part of this, and I'm not youth. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. I have a great answer to that one. I have the best answer ever to that. I'll wait. I show you self control, and you. <laughs> <laughs> I can show self control as well. If you so <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a bit of a direct um, tangent away from that and away from what, sorry, I forgot about that. This is a bit of a tangent away from that and away from what all the speakers have been on about. Hannah had a slide at one stage where, hey, here's all the sorts of person, the sorts of contributor you could be. And it was about, I don't know, a list of about 30 little dots across the screen. I'm a philosopher by trade. And I've done a hell of a lot of refereeing for journals over the decades. And in my trade, and probably Matt has a similar term, I don't know, we call people critical friends. And a critical friend is someone who says, and it might be quite destructive, it might be not that you're positively criticising and a better version of that idea will come out of it, it might be that you're negatively criticising and that idea will go down the gurgler and good riddance to it. So nowhere in there did I see in your organisational talks and anything a role for someone who sits two paces back from the enthusiasm, the buzz, the group think, the whatever, and says, this is dark, it's futile, you can do what you like and you won't change climate change or whatever your best to um, act for mitigation, uh, you not buying a plastic bag won't do a damn thing, and so on and so on. You might need critical friends out there who say the whole slant of this, apart from giving you a good buzz, is misguided. And I saw no sort of mention or role or whatever for that. No, you got to ask me. Yeah. <laughs> I will. That's why I'm jumping in, because I want to answer both. Um, I'm very passionate about group roles when it comes to volunteering, and I know that there were gasps there, and I, I definitely I understand that feeling, but when it comes to productive group environment and volunteering, the critic is actually one of the critical roles to have um, in every group to create a productive outcome. You need a critic, you need an ideas person, you need an implementer, you need somebody who can bring the group together. Um, and for all of those four roles, there are good versions of that role and bad versions of them. When it comes to being the person that brings people together, the joker is the bad version of that in group role theory. And in that case, the person detracts from the conversation by just making people laugh too much. And I have ADHD, so I'm often, I often play that role. Um, but the, the better version of that one is somebody that offers vulnerability to connect people. Um, so actually the critic, if it's used in the right way, is critical to make sure that the solutions you're designing will actually work. And maybe the, the role of the critic is informed by their lived experiences, that, um, but, they, but, they, but they very much are valuable to the group discussion. So yeah, I certainly agree. And on the, that question, I, I was not intending for it to be about youth, but I have a great story recently that recast my perspective. So I was with my partner's nephews for Easter, and they um, they loved playing with me, and like I, I acted like I was scared of them when we were playing soccer together, and they ramped that up by getting their drink bottles and trying to spray me and chasing me around the yard. And I sort of got down on all fours and charged up to him, lifted him up in the air, and he loved that. Ran away, stood up, puffed his chest out, and said, I'm going to get you, old man. <laughs> And that made me realise that age, age very much is relative. And I, one of the reasons that I'm very passionate about positive ageing is 
because when I spend time with people who have had my experience and can, can share their lives with me, I learn so much. Um, so I like engaging with it, but I get so much out of that. So my version of entrepreneurship and volunteering is very much not limited by age. And in the Red Cross, the average age of a volunteer is um, upwards of 70. And that doesn't dissuade me at all. It's just people are people. So yeah, it doesn't matter what age they are. Experience and we have capacity, mm. but but often for me personally, I, I need to learn new skills of mm. communication that has changed vastly. Mm. And, I, and I am, am a, a Red Cross volunteer, very proud Red Cross volunteer, I have to say. And I'm also a Red Cross foster parent, mm. and I do dog first aid workshops. Mm. Anyone in Tassie that wants to come on, one in Queenstown next summer. But and I use that as a vehicle to let people know about how to prepare for a disaster for the animal as well as the <coughs> So, so I use that as an in. Mm -hmm. I also use it as an in for, hey, we, we desperately need respite and foster care around mm -hmm. Australia, let alone Tasmania. Yeah. So, at, the, at the risk of killing But there the is ways of communicating. We do have an online audience as well. We have to, oh, we've got, oh, we've got super technology and mics in the room. Awesome. And just in case anyone missed it, Queenstown this Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> 18th of June. 18th of June. Yeah. I might, yeah, I might just add and say I'm really sorry that that was your experience in the audience, and thank you so much for calling that out. Um, I think, with, particularly with the work we do at Red Cross, using the, the age group of 18 to 30 has just allowed us to get really kind of um, potent data on what the, those changes have been, you know, what those changes are over. Um, different age groups that we're just seeing more and more of with younger people, but it's certainly not. There's also passion and so much to be utilised in it. And I look at the audience and I'm not the only one I've heard. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. But certainly everything we've spoken about tonight is uh, is is, in, is intended to be inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, sorry, can I just answer this gentleman's question too? Yes. Um, and uh, thank you, you know, um, for bringing a philosophical question. I think obviously you have um, a wealth of knowledge in that area, and and I, I like being challenged. Um, I guess for me, the kind of strengths based approach is inspired by like Socrates and the virtues. And I think you'll find in the virtues that there isn't, um, you know, the kind of critic approach. And, and for us, it's really taking that strengths based position. It's not saying that this is the ideal collection of people in order to achieve a group outcome. It's um, a way for people to engage with and reflect on, on their own strengths and the ways that they can show up in a positive way. Have you considered having people also reflect upon their own weaknesses as a suitable piece of information in designing a court inspection? Um, <laughs> look, uh, no, and we are early days in even thinking about strengths-based approaches, but, you know, thanks for, for the challenge. I think um, one thing that I guess I'm hearing in this conversation is that that this is like that volunteering should be universal um, and that we all have different roles to play. And I think that that is so true. Um, I think that I think that like that I have benefited so much like I know in the work that we've done um, in Queensland that um, speaking to um, the advisory board to see inviting um, all the volunteers into our meetings to be able to hear from their perspective has been such an important part of um, our experiences shaping our ideas shaping our plans um, and I think that there's a continual role for that um, that that wealth of experience and knowledge and I, I heard the the um, the question asker before speak about their experiences and that's invaluable um, and I think I think what I'm hearing is that maybe we do need more opportunities to be able to break free of our silos of maybe the way that we've like gathered in age and and be able to to provide those platforms of of crossing knowledge between different groups between different ages between different stages um, and that that we need people who don't just hype up the work that we're doing, but also uh, that we're open to feedback and that we're open to that. Um, I think that 
that the best way to do that is being within an organization, being a part of the action, understanding the ways that they work. And, and that's what I felt with the Red Cross. I've seen probably some really positive things and some some things that we still need to work through. Um, and so I think having some of those, I guess that melting pot of different people, different experiences, different perspectives is, is I guess the colour that comes into volunteering, which is so important. So it's important to have everyone. And I think that um, perhaps we do need um, some more ways to do that, but I, I think that value is, is definitely uh, needs to be emphasised. Brilliant. And which is where it's another question that I'm keen to ask if there are not. Right, we've got more hands. Um, the gentleman up the back, please, sir, if you don't mind. Hi, I'm interested in the, the comment you made, Hannah, about tapping into Indigenous wisdom. I wondered if the panel could talk more about personal experiences or particular case examples that you're aware of. The only one I can think of off the top of my head is some of the fire stick um, farming or the, the burn-offs in the traditional Indigenous way, which I find really, really interesting. Yeah, I guess when I do that acknowledgement, I and, and in the recognition that um, our First Nations people have this wealth of knowledge, I am also recognising that I'm not a First Nations person and I don't have um, visibility and, and experience of a, a lot of um, what our First Nations people do experience, obviously. Um, what we do try to to understand in our work, and, and I know that um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership, leadership team um, do incredible work working with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in disaster preparedness. And, and I know there are examples um, of them working with local people within local contexts, um, using local knowledge to prepare for disasters and, um, and learn from uh, the Indigenous wisdom in those spaces, but as I'm sure you are, are, are understand that they're all individual contexts in, in very um, unique circumstances across Australia. I can only really speak to the work that um, I've done with young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people, and um, that example I, I showed of Nova, um, the young uh, Torres Strait Islander woman who um, is attending our youth summit and, and was involved in our activators program along with um, another a, a number of other young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people we've worked with. Um, we really aim to create spaces where um, those power um, dynamics are minimised as much as um, we are able to consciously do and to recognise that we are in a, a constant state of learning from each other and um, and certainly in our youth space we are um, and, and at the youth summit we are creating space for more of that discussion and learning um, I hope that answers your question in some way I, um... do you have any um, specific examples of the way that indigenous people have given ideas for disaster management? Mm. Um, it's a really great question. It's just not like my space to give um, those exact ex examples. I'm sorry. The title, do you care to answer? Or also, sorry, how do you done? Um, I don't have much to add. I guess I, that um, I think that one thing that's important is that the black what we do is inclusive and I guess it's drawing upon I guess going back to some of the things I guess I, I can't speak much to this but my initiative that uh, my experience um, my community action was grounded in my lived experience and that was that was of that I guess that I'm the expert of um, but I think being able to um, yeah draw upon our own experience while learning from others is really important um, and I guess being able to ask some of those broad questions um, always helps to decipher that but no specific answer to that question. I think it's difficult it depends how far you go back if you go back um, more than a couple of thousand years to ask that question of preparing for disasters 
yes, there were disasters throughout Indigenous history, but they lived in a way that at, at the core, and I'm, I'm approaching this with a lot of intellectual humility and trying not to speak on behalf of Indigenous peoples, but they lived in a way where they took care of the land first, not themselves. And so the idea of living a nomadic lifestyle, of treating the land as sacred, of um, treating each other um, in a way that you're part of a community and everybody matters just as much as each other, all of those approaches we don't have at the core of our society. And so actually at every level, whether it's um, treating the land as sacred, whether it's um, uh, living in a way that's sustainable in every way, we don't do any of those. So it's not so much a matter of finding specific examples for me as it is realising that the way that we approach emergency preparedness as a society is fundamentally flawed and, and focused on fixing the, the symptoms of emergencies rather than preventing them. With half an eye on the time, and I, I, we have, um, I think, time for one more question. This is an online question. It's from Marley. Um, and Marley has directed her question directly to Natalia and Matt. Um, and Marley's interested in your experience developing disastrous dinners for Natalia um, and the student mental health program um, for Matt. Um, now you look back with a little time, what has been the impact slash opportunity slash learning of your personally, uh, for your personally, of starting and delivering those volunteering community action initiatives? We might start with you, Pat, or Natalia, with disastrous dinners. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I've spoken about disastrous dinners to a number of different communities around the nation. And I guess one thing that um, I've personally learned through the and spoken to um, in the international community as well is that there's so much universality. It's easy to think um, that uh, I'm doing this alone, or this is that this is something only for me. But uh, um, as I've talked about disastrous dinners more, there's um, been so much interest from people all over the world around like, yeah, we really need to open this conversation up around preparing for disasters, what your personal plan is, uh, what your options are, what's in your community. Um, I remember talking to a, a group of uh, people from the Pacific and they were saying, you know, like we'd meet at the church because that's where everyone meets. Um, that's the, everyone has one in their village, everyone has one in their community and that's where everyone would go to. And comparing that to maybe in my area where everyone would probably meet um, at the local library because that's in the centre of town for me um, in my suburb. And, and I guess it's that experience that everyone has different um, perspectives but but we but we all have things in common. Um, has something been something that's really stood out to me um, through disastrous dinners? And I think the second thing is just around that um, any action, any conversation uh, that whether you use the tool and it's full, whether you use it a little bit, it continues to plant some of those seeds around um, creating change, making change, and thinking that change starts in like in with our neighbor with my mom with my sister um and i think that idea of starting locally has been something that really has resonated with me throughout um, this experience okay um so i've got two reflections on that the first one is that in leading other people towards the voluntary action i've realized the depth of sort of the strengths that arise from the differences of each member of the group. And one story stands out to me recently. So I've never dived, I've, I've wanted to, but you know, I've, I've never, maybe for financial reasons, but my friend told me about a diving experience and how they connect that to their mental health. So the first time they went deep diving, they had to partner up with somebody and essentially have a rope that they both attach themselves to as they go deeper down for the first time. Their partner was experienced and they went first. And they, as soon as they dived down there, they were just amazed at how different the environment is. They felt serene. Um, they, they just immediately, they wanted to stay down there for as long as they could and, and do it again as soon as possible. But then he looked down and he saw his partner, the experienced diver, with his knife out trying to cut the rope, cut himself free from the rope and, and he was just flailing around in the water. And what you do in that situation is you, you go down to them you, and you bring them up together 
you sit under the water until the nitrogen escapes from the body. Once they got to the top, and he asked him what, what on earth was going on, and he said, I felt like the rope was dragging me down. I, I felt like I had to cut it to, to get free from it. And only having that person there to, to hold him in it, he couldn't solve that problem, but to hold him in that and gradually move him up out of it, that was what he understands mental health to be, that when it's profoundly affected, you feel lost, you can't see what's really happening. And, and even the things that are trying to help you, they feel like they're dragging you down. Um, and just the profoundness of that reflection helped me understand mental health in a better way. And that's true for every individual's understanding of mental health. The second one, and this is maybe a more fun one, um, I tell this story in schools to encourage students to, um, to talk about things, even if you don't say it perfectly. And uh, the reason why I, I love this in the context of taking voluntary actions is because creating positive change doesn't have to be this um, sad exercise in self-reflection and, and nothing else. It's, it's actually can be joyful. Um, and, and so the story is, my friend wanted to come and support me talking about men's mental health, um, but I, I knew him really well. And what he actually wanted to do was meet a local leader who he grew up seeing around his local area. He, he ran a produce store. And he um, turned up at this event with me, um, really excited. He met this person's daughter. Um, that went really well. And then he meets the guy himself. And I could tell that even though he has a poker face, he was really nervous. So when he meets this guy, he goes up to him with the idea that he's going to say, lovely to meet you. But instead, he holds out his hand, looks him straight in the eye and says, I love you. <laughs> and that, that, that actually was way better than anything he could have said because that strengthened that bond immediately. Like they, they may as well have just been immediate friends because just that mutual feeling of just silliness and isn't everything absurd, that actually connected them more than anything. So sometimes if you, in the mental health case, sometimes if you say the wrong thing, but you're open about it and you're willing to just learn and, and talk it through, that's as good as saying the right thing. So that's a great question, Marley, some wonderful answers as well, thank you. For our last formal um, action of the evening, I'm going to call on um, Sharon Wachtel, who is the State Director Tasmania of the Australian Red Cross to give the evening's vote of thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Uh, this event stems from a long-standing partnership between the University of Tasmania and Red Cross. And I kind of like to think that we're both in the same business. <laughs> Whether that be through education, learning, connection or humanitarian action, we're both in the business of building services for our world. And that's what really drives our work together. I'd like to thank our uh, many people that contribute to bringing tonight together, um, particularly our friend and uncle, Dr. Max Kingsworth, <laughs> <laughs> our very inspirational panel, Hannah, Matt, and Natalia. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the New Tabs Oration Committee, which is made up of Professor Nicholas Farrelly, Professor Mr. Marcus Duffy. Matt Killingsworth, Greg Marshall, Linda Bob, and Sarah Goldstone. And we tied this event in to um, connect with World Red Cross Day, which was last Sunday. As it turned out, that was the day also that Red Cross volunteers escorted the last citizen from Maripol. Now, that's a pretty amazing thing when people service their volunteering and their commitment and passion leads them to take action where their own lives are at risk. But that is that power of the movement, it's the power of people. And we shouldn't feel overwhelmed and feel like that puts ourselves at a distance or it doesn't include us, because the response to that is to take simple action. And that's really the story that we've heard tonight. Um, I'm very excited to say thank you for the closing of this event. But also I ask that you all have, take a moment from our inspiration tonight to think about your own local action. We're very pleased this week to be launching 50 Ways to Do More Good. This is a resource that has been developed in Tasmania. It's had made. It's been spread now across the country. And now I believe 
making connections um, to other companies as well. So thank you everyone for joining us and being part of our community. As we heard from our one of our new TAD students this week, community is in itself a form of resistance and it's definitely part of our resilience. So thank you for being part of our community tonight. Uh, really glad and equally proud that you mentioned um, ICRC volunteers and Murray Paul and the amazing work they're doing um, in Ukraine. And okay, you mentioned it at the start and there's never a, a better time for us to think about those things and events such as this. What we're also thinking about the community volunteering. Please, 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 please join me in thanking our keynote speaker, Hannah Miller. Uh, be available online um, by the Island of um, Ideas website. Um, and as restrictions lift, we encourage you to stay in touch with the Island of Ideas website. And we're doing obviously more face-to-face uh, -face events and hybrid events such as this. Thank you so much for taking part in our special event on behalf of the Red Cross and the University of Tasmania. Have a lovely and safe evening. Thank you so much. Good night.